Good evening. I want to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of the uh, National Poverty Center and the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy to our, uh, the first National Poverty S uh, Center seminar of the year. I'm Sheldon Danziger, the Henry J. Meyer Collegiate Professor of Public Policy and co-director of the National Poverty Center, and I'm going to moderate uh, tonight's discussion. Um, for those of you more interested in other activities of the National Poverty Center, there's some brochures I know on the table outside. In particular, we have another seminar in this building next Tuesday afternoon by Roberto Fernandez of uh, MIT. Before I start, I want to thank our program manager, Laura Lee, and our center secretary, Susan Carpenter, for um, helping get this um, event started. And um, whoever the designer was for our poster, um, when we showed it to Jason tonight, he thought uh, we had done a nice job on the poster. So um, whoever the designer is, who I don't know, he's done a good job. <clears throat> I'm really pleased tonight that uh, Jason DeParles of the New York Times uh, is here. Uh, obviously, all of you know he's the author of a new book, American Dream, Three Women, Ten Kids, and a Nation's Drive to End Welfare, which has just been published. And uh, he's on uh, a tour to a variety of places. Um, and uh, we were very fortunate to have him uh, come to the National Poverty Center and the University of Michigan. Um, I should say I first met Jason in 1990 when he was a cub reporter. I think that's still the right term. Uh, and he had just started at the New York Times on the uh, poverty and welfare beat. And I suggested that he come to the annual meeting of the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management uh, because he could find out what was going on uh, and immerse himself and talk to a lot of policy analysts. And so uh, Jason's come a long way now because at this year's public policy meetings, he's going to be talking and all the analysts who he talked to uh, 14 years ago are going to be listening. Uh, for those of you who read the New York Times um, and followed welfare reform in the 90s, I think uh, almost everybody has read uh, one of the many articles uh, he's written in the Times um, uh, that contributed uh, to the background research of the book that, um, that he's produced. Uh, I've been uh, following um, poverty and w welfare reform issues for about 30 years, and I uh, don't think I'm exaggerate, exaggerating when I, I tell you that he is a, uh, a very unique journalist, and this is a very important book. Uh, a lot of reporters are very good at sitting down and talking to real-world people. That's something we academics are not very good at. Uh, so I can think of other reporters who have written high-quality studies about the lives of the poor. But most reporters are not very good at understanding the nuance of public policy. And almost no one uh, is as good as Jason on being able to produce a book like this one, which really shows a deep understanding of the complex social policies that guide us as well as the lives of the people. And I think it's that convergence of his both understanding of the poor and his understanding of the policy process. And for those of us who are policy wonks, we like to read about Senator Moynihan dressing down Professor Elwood and other sound bites and bits that, that appear in the book. Um, I think it's very important um, that uh, the book be widely read. I certainly hope that the country uh, and policymakers focus more on uh, the lives of the poor uh, than has been the case for quite a while. So uh, I hope uh, uh, the book generates more than interest uh, on our campus. Uh, after Jason speaks, we're going to have brief commentaries by two uh, distinguished University of Michigan uh, poverty researchers. And I'm going to introduce everybody now in case people are straggling in on Michigan time, they'll miss hearing me and not miss hearing uh, Jason and the other speakers. So our first respondent will be Sandra Danziger, who is research professor in the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. 
director of the Michigan Program on Poverty and Social Welfare Policy and professor of social work. And she's conducted research, uh, both interviews and survey and quantitative work on the lives and experiences of poor women and is the principal investigator for a panel study of welfare recipients in Michigan. Second will be Alfred Young, Jr., Associate Professor of Sociology and Associate Professor in the Center for African and Afro-American Studies. His book, The Minds of Marginalized Black Men, was published last year uh, by Princeton University Press, and he's focused most of his research on uh, the lives and work and aspirations of uh, poor inner city men. So uh, please join me now in welcoming uh, Jason Parle to the University of Michigan. Thank you. Yes, Sheldon was one of the first uh, people I met when I started the job at the New York Times as a poverty reporter, and uh, he's been a great source of encouragement uh, and explanation of many issues since, and he takes calls at home, which is one thing you really want in a source. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, grateful to call myself uh, one of his students and friends. When, uh, when I was an even younger cub reporter than when Sheldon uh, met me, I saw the film Eleni. Have any of y'all ever seen uh, the film Eleni? It's about a, uh, a young New York Times reporter, in this case, Nicholas Gage, who gets his dream assignment. And uh, for Nicholas Gage, it was to, to go to the Athens Bureau. His mother had been murdered in Athens when he was a child. And he wanted to go back to Athens. And, uh, and, and investigate his mother's murder. And this, the film opens with him coming home to tell his wife, you know, honey, I got the job. And I saw that when I was 23 or so, and I thought, boy, imagine that, to grow up and be a New York Times reporter and get your dream assignment. And I had my own cinematic moment in the course of writing this book. Uh, only my dream wasn't to go to um, Athens, it was to go to Milwaukee and, sp <laughs> and spend a year writing about welfare, right? Yeah. <clears throat> So I had to sell it to my boss, Joe Lelliveld, who was the executive editor of the New York Times. So I walked in, and he was a little skeptical at first. He thought, eh, if we're going to invest a year writing about welfare, we should go someplace in our readership area. And why well, go to Milwaukee? And I had to go tell him this is a place where uh, national history is being made, and it would redound to his credit to make this investment in Milwaukee. And he finally said, oh, okay. And he escorted me out of his office and put an avuncular arm on my, on my shoulder and said, you know I've been to Milwaukee. And I thought, oh, this is, this, is my, this is my Nick Gage moment. You know, he's going to say, and this is a story that's going to challenge you in ways you've never been challenged. Or you're going to, I've been to Milwaukee, and you're going to make Midwestern values that will just stay with you. The friends and values will stay with you the rest of your, your life. Instead, he said, um, I've been to Milwaukee, so I know your motives are pure. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you're trying to go to Honolulu. <clears throat> Uh, the book is called American Dream, and it takes its title from the first welfare speech in Clinton's presidency in which he said, I think we all know in our heart of hearts that too many people, too many of our people never get a shot at the American dream. It starts with two coincidental and ultimately colliding events, both in October 1991. Uh, the first one is that Clinton, then the governor of Arkansas and the long shot candidate for the presidency, made his first welfare speech in which he threw in a line, uh, from, excuse me, made his first domestic policy speech and threw in a line about welfare. He said, in the Clinton presidency, I'm going to, we're going to end welfare as we know it. Uh, the book actually starts with the crafting of this phrase, his speechwriter in his office on a Saturday night trying to come up with something catchy. The second thing that happened that same month is two women got off a bus from Chicago to Milwaukee um, to start a new life on welfare. Their names are Angela Job and Jewel Reed, and they're two of the main characters of the book. Uh, their boyfriends had gone, they were living with their, they're from Chicago and living with their boyfriends in Chicago, <clears throat> excuse me, and their boyfriends had gone to jail. <clears throat> uh, when their boyfriends went to jail, they no longer were able to pay the rent. Uh, welfare in Chicago, the rent was more than the entire welfare check. So even if you took your whole welfare check, gave it to the landlord, you still couldn't even rent an apartment, never mind, pay your other expenses. In Milwaukee, the arithmetic was reversed. Rents were lower and the checks were higher, so you could rent an apartment and still have a little bit of money left over for your other expenses. And that comprised the entirety of what they knew about Milwaukee when they got off the bus there. They had no idea, of course, that they were getting off the bus in a place that, uh, to start a life on wealth, new life on welfare in a place that was going to become the end welfare capital of the world. So 
uh, eventually these two narrative lines, the drive to end welfare, their lives starting, uh, starting their lives over after their boyfriends uh, went to jail on welfare, those two lines come together in Milwaukee. Uh, they recruited a third woman to come up with them. The three are cousins, so it's a story of one extended family. The third woman's name is Opal Caples. They spent four or five years living together in Milwaukee. Then the changes came down in the mid-1990s. Two of the three women became full-time steady workers uh, as a result of the, the new work rules. Uh, that's Angie and Jewel. Opal, the third woman, uh, had a more tragic uh, fall through the system than I, than I would have guessed possible at the time. In fact, I thought Opal was going to be the success. The other elements of the book, and I'll come back to Opal in a second, um, there's a political history in the book that explains uh, how the old AFDC system, the old welfare system, was created, uh, why it was hard to reform, and what happened in the mid-1990s that led to its demise. And there's also a chapter or several chapters of family history. Um, Angie, Opal, and Jewel are African American, and I got fascinated with their uh, family history and was able to trace it back six generations. Jewel's mother came to Milwaukee to visit one day, a woman named Hattie Mae Crenshaw, and in a kind of casual way, I said, oh, Ms. Crenshaw, tell me about your life. And uh, this was one of, the, one of the great lines I've ever heard someone say in my reporting career. She, she looked at me very calmly, and she said, well, Jason, I was born on Senator Jim Eastland's plantation in 1937 at a time when black peoples was just beginning to come out of slavery. And... Uh, you know, what do you, th as a reporter, all sorts of bells are going on in my, in my head. First of all, Eastland, James Eastland is a name that will mean a lot to a few of you and maybe nothing at all to, to many of you. James Eastland was one of the last towering segregationists of the South. He was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee for 22 years during the Civil Rights era, and he used to go around boasting that he had a, a special vest pocket where the Civil Rights bills went to die. Um, one of the last unapologetic white supremacists in the uh, in the United States Senate. So was Hattie Mae, I'm thinking, was she really from the Eastland Plantation? Was this something she'd heard in the family? Is it, you know, and everything that she said checked out to be exactly true, not only then, but in, in, in every aspect of her life. Um, the family was indeed from, she was indeed born on the Eastland Plantation. She still had relatives living there. In uh, the summer of 2000, I went down and met her 85-year-old uncle, uh, Mac Caples, who was still, had spent his life as a sharecropper. The plantation was still in the Eastland family. Caples were still living there. And what she said about 1937 was remarkably accurate, too. She didn't say when black people were in slavery. She said when black people were just beginning to come out of slavery. And that phrase, you know, it kind of threw me for a minute. I'm thinking 1937, slavery. But if you go back and read Southern history, and particularly Mississippi history, um, the early 1940s, the late 1930s, that's a period where really um, – the drive toward freedom is just resuming after this long hiatus. I mean, there was a flowering of political freedom for black people in Mississippi after, uh, during Reconstruction, but it came to a, a violent end in 1876 with the election there, and, and disenfranchisement formally came down in, with the Constitution of 1890. So it's three or four generations, or, or excuse me, decades later, and really the, the, you know, the, 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 the thirst for freedom is just beginning to, to make itself known again in Mississippi. So in every aspect. Hattie Mae was a, a quite an accurate um, uh, teller of her story, and uh, I think her experiences with poverty and dependency and deprivation frame the rest of the story. Uh, most of what I want to talk about tonight is Angie. Uh, she, uh, of the three women, she's the one who puts her heart into her work the most, and I want to talk about what it brought her, both what it brought her in terms of meaning for herself, what it brought her in terms of money, and what it brought her for her kids. Um, and with your indulgence, <clears throat> maybe I'll read you just a, a paragraph or two of the introduction to Angie. This is uh, after a, a passage that says uh, the new law in time, or the phrase end welfare as we know it, would in time send nine million women and children streaming from the rolls. One of those women was Angela Job. The moment Bill Clinton announced he was running for president, she stepped off a Greyhound bus in Milwaukee to start a new life. She was 25 years old and arrived from Chicago towing two large duffel bags and three young kids. Angie had a pretty milk chocolate face and a fire plug build, and the combination could make her seem tender or tough, depending on her mood. She had never seen Milwaukee before, and she pronounced herself unimpressed. Why they got all these old-ass houses, she growled, growled, where's the brick at? 
Irreverence was Angie's religion. She arrived in Milwaukee as she moved through the world. A short, stout fountain of exclamation points, half of them capping sentences that would peel paint from the bus station walls. The cascade of off-color commentary flowing alongside the late-night cans of Colt 45 could make Angie seem like a jaded veteran of ghetto life. Certainly she had plenty to feel jaded about. She grew up on the borders of Chicago's gangland. Her father was a drunk. She had her first baby at 17, two more in quick succession, and dropped out of high school. She didn't have a diploma or a job, and the man she loved was in jail. By the time she arrived in Milwaukee, she had been on welfare for nearly eight years, the sum of her adult life. Still, her mother had worked two jobs to send her to parochial school, and though Angie tried to hide it, she still bore traces of the English student from Aquinas High. Lots of women came to Milwaukee looking for welfare checks. Not many then felt the need to start a poem about their efforts to discern God's will. I'm tired of trying to understand what God wants of me, she wrote. Then worried that was too irreverent, Angie substituted the words, the world, for God, and hid the unfinished page in a bag. Stories of street fights she was happy to share, but the bag was so private that hardly anyone knew it existed. Don't you know I like looking mean, she said one day. While it sounded like one of her self-mocking jokes, she segued into a quiet confession. If people think you're nice, they'll take your kindness for weakness. That's a side of me I don't want anybody to see. That way I don't have to worry about nobody hurting me. I actually didn't find out about Angie's bag and her poetry and the other things in it until um, I had known her for four, four or more years, and I had written a whole chapter about one part of her life um, that I had to completely throw out and, uh, and reinterpret after she opened up more and showed me some journal passages she had written as an adolescent. She had been on welfare for nearly 12 years uh, when the new law passed. She had no high school education, and within six months, she became a steady full-time worker. Um, it's really a, a remarkable testament, I think, to her resilience and her resourcefulness. I mean, everything about her, we went for years, as you know, Sheldon was uh, saying, Sheldon and I have been talking about welfare since 1990, for years talking about how the jobs weren't there for the people, and they didn't have the skills, and there weren't the supports for them, they didn't get the child care. And here, Angie, in, uh, in a matter of a, a few quick months, leaves the roles, becomes a full-time worker at a nursing home. Uh, one of the things that I, I had to learn about in order to write the book was the, the nursing home industry. It was a, a, a type of job I just hadn't thought about much before. Uh, nursing aides do really dirty, dangerous work. I mean, this is maybe obvious to, to many of you. It wasn't entirely obvious to me. Did you know that nursing aides get, get injured more often than coal miners? Uh, I mean, when I first read that, I couldn't believe it. I called the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they'd say, yeah, yeah, it's true. And then I'd call back a week later, and they'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. It's, yeah. Him again, yeah, yeah, it's true. I just didn't believe that it could possibly, it's from all the lifting. They're constantly lifting old people, um, uh, lifting them from the showers, lifting them from, from their beds, lifting them from chairs. Uh, you go in the break room in a nursing home, and, and the nursing aides sit around and tell jokes about the shooting pains down their back. They traffic in infectious fluids, you know, in blood, in urine, in vomit. Uh, they earn not a whole lot more than the minimum wage. Angie was earning about seven, I think starting wage was about seven twenty-five, seven fifty when she started. Um, one, one out of five lives in poverty. One out of four has no health insurance, even though they, they, uh, they staff the health care industry. And Angie loved it. Uh, she loved everything about, <laughs> except the pay, everything about being a nursing aide. Um, she liked the nursing home. She liked the bright, clean building. Uh, she liked putting on a, her smocks and thinking of herself as a nurse. She really she liked the teamwork of patient care. She liked the you know, the gossip in the break room, and she really liked the patients. Um, above all, she liked the patients. It brought out her work as a nursing aide brought out a a vein of empathy and creativity and 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 human connectedness in her that I think nothing else in her experience had. And this was one of the things that uh, Clinton and other people had at times talked about. Work brings dignity, work, uh, work brings structure, work brings meaning to people's lives. I, I was a little skeptical of some of that, not entirely, but um, I have to say in Angie's life, you know, it largely proved true. I think she had more patience for her patients than she did for her children. Early on in Angie's uh, experience as a nursing aide, she was tending to an elderly white woman, a frail, frightened woman who couldn't really take care of herself maybe in the first stages of Alzheimer's. Angie's leaning over her to clean her up, and the woman looks up at her, embarks a racial epithet. 
get your hands off me, you you know what. Uh, on the street, you know, a- Angie's fist would have been up or her, yeah, her knife would have been out of her pocket or who knows what. Um, I mean, those would have been fighting words. In the nursing home, Angie just laughed at the woman. She said, well, the you-know-what is taking care of you because you can't do it yourself, so you might as well just let me. And so I barks right back at her and cackles. Um, and I asked Angie about that. And she said, oh, old people, you know, they're not responsible for what they say. You, can, you, you have to make allowances for them. I mean, there was a kind of um, generosity, you know, that it really tapped into on her part. That's the good news. You know, well, the two pieces of good news, I guess, that A, that she could work far beyond what we thought was possible, and, and B, that she took pride in it and it mattered to her. Um, the bad news, it just didn't pay very well at all. Uh, Angie's uh, released her, Angie and Jewel, both of them, released their earnings and welfare records for a dozen years to me, so I could not just go by their reconstruction of how much income they had, but by their, their real uh, records, both welfare, food stamps, excuse me, tax credits, and then also their wage records from that they paid into the state uh, that the state had kept track of for unemployment insurance. So it was a pretty good uh, set of records of what their real economic uh, experiences had been. If you take the last five years that Angie spent on welfare and the first three years that she spent off, average those years, she was about $3,400 ahead being off of welfare. After you count the declines in welfare and food stamps and the increase in earnings, taxes, put everything in, she's up about $3,400. In her case, that's about 15% a year. So that sounds pretty good. You know, everybody would, nobody would mind a 15% raise, except it doesn't count work expenses. And if you take an even modest uh, estimate of her work expenses, say just uh, she really didn't have many work expenses for child care because she left, mostly left the kids to mind themselves. She had an 11-year-old who sort of watched the 7-year-old and the 5-year-old and the 2-year-old. So um, <laughs> it wasn't a great child care uh, uh, situation, but it wasn't expensive. She did have a car and bus expenses, intermittently car and then sometimes bus. If you took an even modest uh, estimate of what the transportation was, you'd wipe out half the gain. Plus, Angie lost her health insurance during that time. So in Angie's case, that didn't really matter too much. Well, it mattered, but it, didn't, it wasn't a catastrophe because Angie, for the most part, was healthy. But Jewel, the other woman who became a full-time steady worker, also lost her health insurance, and she had bleeding ulcers, so she was hospitalized during this period. Uh, and had her wages garnished. And Jewel didn't even think it was notable enough to talk about it. The way I found out that she'd gotten her wages garnished is she was heating the house with the oven. So I said, why are you heating the house with the oven? Well, because I can't afford heating oil. Why can't you afford heating oil? Because they're garnishing my wages. And I said, oh, my God, they're garnishing your wages. And she looked at me and she said, well, everybody who works is going to have their wages garnished, as though it was just a, how could you be surprised by that? Uh, I was really surprised at the level of ongoing material hardship in the women's lives. Angie and Jewel each out-earned about 85% of the women leaving the roles in Wisconsin. So these are successful workers. You know, we're not, these are, they're at the top of the class. There's not exactly as good as it gets, but close to it. So it wouldn't surprise me if you came to me and said at the beginning of this social experiment, said some people will be hungry. That wouldn't surprise me. But it would have surprised me if you said, the people who rank in the 85th percentile of the earnings distribution are going to be hungry. And Angie and Jewel had more struggles with just to keep food in the house than, than I eat, not only than I would have expected, than I, than I initially understood, because they didn't talk about it. Nobody ever said, I'm hungry. But I came to understand that, hey, there'd be a fight breakout, it'd be 9 o'clock at night, and you'd realize that the real issue behind it is everybody's hungry because there hasn't been a dinner. Or one time, on Angie's 33rd birthday, I stopped by the nursing home to see her in the afternoon, and she didn't want to say, I'm hungry, but somehow she brought it up that she, she just hadn't gotten around to eating anything that day, and this was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and you know, if I'm going that way, would I mind grabbing a burger for her? Uh, Angie's work me- meant more to her than I would have expected, but it paid less than, it, than I would have expected also. The third area that I wanted to mention about um, a third lens in which to evaluate her work experience would be what it meant to the kids. And this is probably where I'm most pessimistic. I don't think Angie lost ground economically. I just don't think she made up enough ground. Um, so you could you could call that kind of you know a tug of war in which she, she stayed steady but didn't gain. Um, I feel less optimistic about the situation of the kids. We had this idea 
that when mothers go to work, they'll be role models for their kids. Clinton talked about this relentlessly. He had a woman named Lily Harden that he liked to talk about. Any, any of y'all ever heard Clinton tell the Lily Harden story? He met her when he was governor of Arkansas. And she came off through the welfare program in, in Arkansas, went through one of his welfare to work, got a job. And he said, asked her what was the best thing she liked about being off welfare. Clinton tells the same story, tells the story the same way every time. And she, and she looked me in the eye and she said, now when my boy goes to school and they ask what your mama does, he can give an answer. Between the time that Clinton told that story as governor and the time he repeated it as president, that kid, that teenager, went to jail for a shooting. Clinton went on to tell the story 20 more times as president, never knowing that. Um, Tommy Thompson had a similar story about a woman named Michelle Crawford that he was celebrating for the example that her work had been done for her kids. She had a son who was arrested in the middle of it, too. I mentioned those just as backdrop because this idea that mothers, working mothers, are going to put their kids on a different trajectory is so deeply held. It's just it has a, such an intuitive appeal. We all want to believe it. I want to believe it. When I would talk to my high school friends, people not in the world of social policy, I'd say, I'm writing this book. It's about these women. One of they, two of them became workers. The first thing they'd say is, oh, I'll bet the kids are proud. You know, it's just, it's just a deeply held hope, I think, that many people have. And I just didn't find it confirmed in the real world. Um, when Angie went to work, there was more stress on the family. There was more responsibility on the older kids to take care of the younger kids. And it also just meant that, that the kids were alone more often. Uh, the real role model in Angie's kids' lives wasn't Angie. It was Jewel's boyfriend, Ken, who at this point was both a drug dealer and a pimp. So Red, Angie's son, when he's asked to, in school, Ken, this drug dealer, is like the only guy who takes any interest in the kids. So they really look up to him, particularly the only man. I mean... To say he's a drug dealer and pimp makes him sound like a bad guy. He's also a very engaging guy. He's a smart guy. He's a funny guy. He likes to take the kids to play basketball. He's the fun guy to be around in the family. And the kids know where he gets his money. So when Red is writing an eighth grade essay about cities that he'd like to visit, um, he says he wants to go to Las Vegas because uh, Horan is legal out there. Hoan is legal there. I mean, that's how role model tr theory and trajectories are translating in, in down in, filtering down into Red's life. In Keisha, his older sister, when she was 14, Angie let her spend weekends with one of Ken's prostitutes who kind of befriended Keisha and would take her to do her nails and have her hair done and buy her clothes. Uh, we, we had this idea that, that work alone was going to change the social dynamics in the family, and everything I saw, as well as what I read in the broader literature, makes me skeptical about that idea. Um, when I'm talking to affluent friends about their kids, the, you know, the common complaint is always, our kids have such overscheduled lives, we have to rush them from music to soccer to school to the volunteer activity to, the, to this to that. I mean, what Angie's kids, their, their childhood seemed to pass like in just this total sea of boredom, you know, inter interrupted by like islands of violence or, or, or chaos when something would go wrong in the house. They really just had nothing to do. And we were talking at dinner about... Um, Alex Kotlowitz's great book, There Are No Children Here. I sometimes felt like dinner, dinner time at Angie's house was there are no parents here. You know, she was working second shift. She'd go in at 2 o'clock at night. She'd get out at 10. She had a boyfriend in the house. The kids didn't like the boyfriend. All kinds of fights going on inside the house. Kids running to the pay phone, calling mom. Mom can't pick up the phone because she's busy with the patients. The third uh, woman I wrote about is Opal. And she was the one I thought was going to be the success story. She's the only one of the three who had a high school degree. She had a little bit of community college. She had been married. If we were doing a barrier study on her on the surface, she would look like the one most employable. What I didn't know is that Opal was, uh, she was addicted to cocaine when I first met her, crack cocaine. And she had a, what, her story is a terrible story about her own personal tragedy, but it's also cast a very disturbing light on the Wisconsin social services system, on the welfare bureaucracy, uh, on the welfare bureaucracy in Milwaukee. And I, th I think, I can't prove it, but I think probably on, bureauc on the welfare bureaucracies nationwide. I mean, because Wisconsin's was sell Wisconsin won the, the national award as the best welfare bureaucracy in the country. So you have to think if things were this troubling in Wisconsin, 
they're going to be um, you know, not so great in New York City or Los Angeles. Opal at one point was binging, selling off her furniture for drug money, out of food, in danger of having her kids taken by the state. And she walks into a welfare office and says, you know, I'm desperate, please help me. And you know what they told her? I mean, for Opal to do this, you, you know, to go in the welfare office and say this, you, you know there's a situation serious. They said, I'm sorry we don't take walk-ins. Go home and make an appointment. Um, <clears throat> she had six different workers at three different agencies. The Wisconsin system, to give you the background, was private. They took Milwaukee and they carved it into six competing districts and they put it up for bid. They privatized it so that five different private agencies all had a piece of the city. Some of them were like blue chip nonprofits like Goodwill and the YWCA. Some were black, uh, grassroots African American or Latino groups. Uh, the African American one was called the Opportunities Industrialization Center. And one was this corporate for profit entity called Maximus Inc. It's a trades on the New York Stock Exchange. It's got contracts in almost every state. So they tried to, the idea was um, all these agencies were going to compete with each other and we'll see which works the best. Opal was at three of the different agencies. OIC, the Black Grassroots Group, Goodwill, the Blue Chip Nonprofit, and Maximus, the for-profit. She got exactly the same result at all. She had six caseworkers and three agencies. None of them ever figured out she was a drug addict. Even though it was written in her case file, all I had to do was read it. None of them gave her it, even the most minimal service. Um, at one point, she was homeless, pregnant, and living in a crack house. They just mailed the checks to her. Um, essentially, Wisconsin's W-2 program was buying the crack. There's a chapter in the book it looks inside one of these agencies at what was happening there. Um, it was utter chaos. The head of the agency, <laughs> I'm not making this up, had his wife, his son, his niece, his mistress, and his mistress's mother all on the payroll. The, <laughs> Maximus said we practice, they encouraged nepotism because uh, they, they called it a, uh, an effective way. They said you should hire family and friends as a good way of recruiting talent. So they practiced what they preached. Uh, the number two in the office had her son on the payroll till he went to jail for reckless homicide. The caseworkers at the agency, one of them was quietly pushed out of the door after impregnating a client. Another was arrested after demanding uh, financial kickbacks from clients. Another was sort of shoved out the door after trying to enlist clients in drug dealing schemes. Um, several of the, uh, at least two of the caseworkers that Opal saw were on drugs themselves. One of them wound up on on the, one of the caseworkers within a year was on the caseload as a, as a client as well. Um, they were forced to pay back a, a million dollars in state money for mis, misusing state, state money. It was supposed to be going to clients. They had this windfall of money because the caseload had gone down so much. They were spending it on golf balls and golf tees that they were giving to state legislators and bus ads that promoted the company. Um, it was just an utter waste of opportunity. I mean, it's so much. This was just. This is. If you've been watching social services uh, as long as, as as Sheldon or even I have, um, it's almost never you get the opportunity to have this much money and this much autonomy to really help people. That was what was a tragedy. I mean, it's uh, about what what happened in Milwaukee. Um, they really could have done something big with the opportunity they had, and uh, I think the state just kind of turned over the keys to these private agencies and looked the other way. You know, as long as the caseload was going down, didn't want to know. The one last point I want to hit on um, about the book, something I hadn't consciously focused on before I started following the families was the, the terrible, deep importance of the fathers. Um, the subtitle of the book is Three Women, Ten Kids. None of the ten kids had a relationship with their father, and they all yearned for one. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk in Washington about fatherhood, and what struck me was how in a totally different context it just arose spontaneously. There was just this deep yearning, not just for the money that a father, you know, the, the second earner could provide, but for the emotional connection. Uh, Keisha, Angie's teenage daughter, her father went to jail f for his role in a murder, when she was a teenager, going into high school, he'd been in jail for nearly um, a decade by then. She chose to go to a cross-town high school, a magnet school, because it had a pre-law program. And Keisha's not a good student. She had asthma on top of it. So it was really hard for her to get across town. So this is a detriment to her education. You know, If you're trying to help Keisha get to school, 
she missed 50% of, she was absent 50% of seventh grade. So you don't want to make it, you know, you want a school close by. You don't want to, you don't want to increase the hurdles for her to get to where she needs to go. She chose the school because it had a pre-law program and she wanted to get her dad out of jail. She'd always told her dad, he'd been gone for almost 10 years, that she would get him out of jail. I mean, he was, wasn't even, on the one hand, he wasn't a figure in her life at all. And on the other hand, he was constantly, he was such a profound figure, he guided her choice of high school. Angie, her mother, didn't, have a, didn't really have a relationship with her father either. He was a terrible alcoholic. Um, she hadn't seen him for a number of years and saw him right before she moved to Milwaukee and was startled by how much he had deteriorated. He couldn't even go to the bathroom by himself. She took him to the bathroom. She spent like an hour with him in the park. It was the best visit that they had really ever had together. And a month later, she, she was in Milwaukee, and he was dead. That was the last time she saw him. So at one point, I was trying to figure out what made Angie decide to become a nursing aide, given all this lifting and pulling and all this terrible uh, fluids you have to deal with. Why would you go do this when you could go work in a fast food restaurant or whatever? So I read a couple of nursing home ethnographies, uh, ethnographies of nursing home workers. And the theory is that people are drawn to the caregiving role itself, right? That they find something rewarding just in being a caretaker beyond the money involved. Kind of a fancy theory. I always had fancy theories about Angie. She always scoffed at them. She has this look kind of like she'd been sucking on a lemon. And she would look up at me and she would shake her head and say, that's your crazy stuff. Or how could you be so stupid? Or um, haven't you learned anything yet? And so... <clears throat> She's a tougher teacher than Sheldon. Uh, so I'm gearing up for my big, Angie, you really feel the need to be a caretaker, you know, question. And I said, Angie, I'm kind of wondering about what made you be a, a nurse aide. And she said, well, I'll tell you. I spit it right out. She said, I'll tell you why. It's because of my daddy. I mean, she just spit it right out. And she said, I really felt guilty. I wasn't there to take care of him. And... Being a nursing aide is, uh, you know, is her way of making up for this lost ground. It's, I mean, what a profound thing, I thought, to be able to, uh, not only that it exists, but to be able to articulate it and think of it. And, you know, I'm becoming a nursing aide out of a desire to connect with my father, who's, who I never really knew. Uh, and I could go on, you know, ten other examples like that, of just the yearning that the, that the women felt. Uh, yeah, I say women because it's not just the kids. It's Angie and even Hattie Mae, the grandmother who didn't really know her father, too. There's a story about her yearning for her father. Um, there's a lot of times in an after-dinner speech about welfare, you hear people say, well, these kids grow up year after year, and they've never seen anybody get up and go to work. It's just not the case. Angie, Opal, and Jewel, all three of them had working mothers. Their mothers were not on welfare. And they, you know, two of the three have now become working mothers. You see work in the ghetto all the time. I think what comes closer to the truth is that Angie, Opal, and Jewel didn't grow up having the stable presence of a second parent to provide the income and the nurturing and the emotional connection and just the extra set of hands for those mothers. And that, I think, more than anything else is what their kids yearn for. So when I think about the future of public policy, I'm hoping that now that we've at least made some minimal progress in getting the women to work, that it can turn more to the, to the men's side of the equation. Um, I'm asked sometimes if I think of their story as a hopeful one. And, you know, in one level, it's hard to f talk about hope when you have people running out of food full time, you know, People who are getting up every morning, going to work at a nursing home at 6 o'clock in the morning and doing their, their share to take care of our mothers, our, our aunts, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, and you feel like they come home to an empty refrigerator and aren't eating. So, you know, is this a hopeful story? Um, I would say, actually, it is, despite all that, for two reasons. Um, I think it's incredibly hopeful just the sheer amount of resilience and resourcefulness that Angie and Jewel were able to show. I mean, Angie would come in sometimes at 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning, and she'd be up at 5 in the morning going back down to the nursing home. Just, just the physical load she bore at, you know, 4 foot 11. Um, and the emotional load of raising four kids and being able to do that, become a full-time steady worker, move into the, to the workplace. Um, one hand used to talk about poor people as being dependents, and he used to say to be dependent is to hang. He had another phrase, you know, without welfare, the children would be blown to the wind, as though... These were inert beings. They were, they were helpless. They were going to be blown away without the government support of the, of the old AFDC system. I mean, Angie never saw her, thought of herself as depending on anything. She thought of herself as a, as a survivor, and she proved to be that. So, yeah, there's something to cheer for in that. And the second thing I think that's hopeful about her story is that as a, as a, as a 
piece of social policy, I think the 1996 law worked somewhat. It worked at least at one of its three goals, which was to, it worked to get people into the workplace. It didn't work to get them out of poverty substantially. It didn't work to give the kids a new trajectory of life, to give them kids a new life. And those are you know terrible failures that we still need to grapple with. But when I started, uh, work, I started writing about ghetto poverty in, in the mid 1980s when all the indices were bad and getting worse. You know, crime was up, unemployment was up, welfare was up, earnings were down. Just everything seemed hopeless, and nothing the government had tried had worked at all. So. The imperfect achievements of this, these past eight years, I think, rehabilitate the notion that government policy can do something, however, however partial, however inadequate. To me, to borrow a term from diplomacy, this should be a uh, a confidence building measure. Yeah, we haven't gotten, you know, if you start to think, if you think of Angie's and Opal and Jewel's journey as being one of 200 years out of slavery and towards freedom and towards full enfranchisement in the, in American life, no, they're not there yet. But they're a little bit farther along, I think, than where they were. And uh, if you work in the realm of social policy, um, that's something to take at least um, enough encouragement from to keep trying. I want to close with just uh, one, one last um, thought about the notion of entitlement, because it was a word that got bandied about so much in the debate. And I always felt like it just didn't align at all with what I saw in, in Angie's uh, and Jewel's lives. The welfare revolution grew from the fear that the poor were mired in a culture of entitlement, stuck in a swamp of excessive demands, legal prerogatives, social due. There certainly was a culture of entitlement in American life, but it was scarcely concentrated at the bottom, as anyone following the wave of corporate scandals now knows. What really stands out about Angie and Jewel is how little they felt they were owed. They went through life acting entitled to nothing, not heat or lights, not medical care, not even three daily meals, and they scarcely complained. When welfare was there for the taking, they got on the bus and took it. When it wasn't, they made other plans. In ending welfare, the country took away their single largest source of income. They didn't lobby or sue. They didn't march or riot. They made their way against the odds into wearying underpaid jobs, and that does now entitle them to something, to a shot at the American dream more promising than the one they've received. Thank you. Uh, well, first I want to thank Jason DeParle and um, the National Poverty Center for this wonderful opportunity and, uh, and for the chance to read the book in advance. Um, I've read it. It's a must read. It's really terrific. And I think for anyone who's concerned about how the 1996 welfare reform affected our vulnerable citizens, it's really uh, something that we, it, we can wrestle with. Um, in my remarks, I, I would really want to try to do at least two things and maybe more if there's time. Um, I want to first kind of look at how representative the families are, the Capels family that uh, Jason focuses on, although he interviewed lots of people throughout the decades. It's really the uh, this extended family that's the focus of the book. And so I want to sort of put it in some context of how, how much their experiences compare to what we now know about uh, many of the single mothers th generally throughout the nation who were um, exposed to welfare reform. And then I want to draw some policy implications uh, have, and just sort of give out some ideas of uh, my reflections as both a long-term observer and researcher of this w uh, welfare reform and others in the past, as well as from uh, a reader of the book. Um, so first of all, uh, to what extent do welfare recipients in general have the same kinds of problems uh, in terms of the barriers to employment that Angie, Opal, and Jewel have? Um, and that we read about in the book. Are there sim are and then secondly, I want to talk about whether there's uh, there are similarities in their post ninety six work and welfare experiences, and how much they kind of fit the the uh, patterns of women in in general. Like Jason, many researchers have documented that welfare recipients face multiple barriers to employment. Uh, for example, in our Michigan study. 59% of the women who were recipients in 1997 had either a serious physical limitation or met uh, screening criteria for a mental health problem such as depression, post-traumatic uh, stress, 
or disorder or general anxiety. We interviewed uh, our respondents several times, and by 2001, uh, the overwhelming majority, 85% of the women in our random sample from an urban community had experienced at least one of these problems at least one of the times in the study. So that's pretty comparable to some of the, the trials and tribulations. Um, in addition, uh, the Urban Institute's national survey documents that about a third of the caseload, the welfare caseload in 99 and in 2002, had very poor physical or mental health. Um, so I think one of the lessons uh, that comes out of the book, as well as the research that many of us has done, is, is really the more we probe and get to know uh, some of the people in these situations, and the more honest people are with us, and he talked about kind of uncovering more and more as he got to know people better, the more difficulties that we, we actually find and we uncover. I think the extent of poor health, mental health, child health problems, domestic violence, trauma history, substance abuse, et cetera, is much greater than I think before uh, many of us did this work uh, would have hypothesized. And still, uh, the women go to work, as Jason says. Um, the single mothers keep going to work. They work at lower levels when they have these problems than those who don't, but um, it's still pretty remarkable. So what are some policy implications we would, uh, I would draw from the barriers and others have? I think uh, there's a great quote in the book that sums up the kind of missed opportunities of the welfare reform. Uh, Jason writes, uh, ordered lives, elevated hopes, inspired kids, a lot to hope from a, a low-wage job. Um, the premise of a job, any job, allowed state welfare agencies to transform themselves from a check-writing office to a require job search only kind of program, but without sufficient attention to assessment of and providing services for a wide range of these problems uh, that are in single mothers' lives, the programs have only been accountable for reducing the caseload and having recipients participate in, in job search. Job retention has been neglected and not much energy has gone into looking at how can we upgrade skills or help employees cope with work-family conflicts. And I think, so the bottom line is that these programs really need to do more to deliver the services that they promised. And there are lots of examples in the book of the women uh, turning to the programs and expecting more help than they actually got. Another issue of representativeness is how, uh, is uh, regard the trends in work and welfare and poverty and whether the, the trajectories in the lives of the Capels family sort of are, are comparable to uh, the population at large. And, I think there's remarkable uh, consistency. The current, if we look at current population survey data on single mothers who have a high school degree or less, um, which would uh, be comparable, we find uh, just some of the figures nationally. In terms of work, there was a big jump in increase in work uh, among single mothers with low education over this period. About 65% of them work, uh, had worked at some point in 1995. It went to a high of about 78% in 2000, and that declined only a little bit um, after the recession to about 73% of them worked at some point in 2002. Welfare receipt, on the other hand, went down dramatically across the board, uh, more dramatically than work increased. About a third of the single mothers received cash welfare in 95, and that fell to only about 12 percent, one in eight by 2002. Um, and a, a worrisome trend, I think, in these data that we're starting to learn more about is the proportion of single mothers who report that they rely on neither earnings nor cash welfare as sources of support. In uh, 96, about 13 percent of single, of low educated single mothers had neither of those sources of support. But that went up to 20 percent. So one in five of low educated single mothers had neither welfare nor work by 2002. And again, uh, in terms of poverty, poverty does decline, but it still remains quite high for this population. About 50 percent of low educated single mothers were poor, had below poverty income in 95, and by 2002, it had only dropped to 42 percent. So I would underscore the book's theme that many recipients were, were indeed successful in moving from welfare to work, and even though a high proportion played by the rules, they are still treading in the thick, muddy water, uh, similar to the stories that Jason tells. They're still poor, and they're still vulnerable to setbacks in holding on to jobs, coping with family crises, and finding resources to meet family members' needs. 
Now, when Donna Shalala was secretary of HHS, she gave many speeches, one right here in Michigan, I think at the Power Center, saying that the Clinton administration had hoped that welfare reform would usher in a next wave of reform that would make work pay for welfare recipients and non-recipients alike. And these make work pay provisions uh, that many people talk about, had talked about at the time, I think need to be taken up again, revisited and expanded. And they need to be viewed both as the next phase of welfare reform and also as connected to investing in America's current and future workforce. I believe we, uh, it may sound old fashioned, especially in this, uh, we don't hear this in the campaign too much, but I believe we need a stronger floor of security and support for those who work. So I would call for an increase in the minimum wage, which has not been increased since 1997 reforms to make subsidized health insurance available to the working poor and the near poor, expansions in the earned income tax credits. Uh, those are really important uh, to the Capels women and to, uh, in our studies as well. Uh, expansions in child care, after school programs, uh, and supports to guarantee that when people work they shouldn't be poor. And I would also include looking at affordable housing, education reform, and access to higher education. And I would also uh, reiterate that I think a bill to expand provisions in those programs should begin with a preamble that really reflects what a lot of the research and Jason's work shows. Uh, we should have a preamble the, for a funding bill like this that proclaims that the research evidence is unequivocal, that most poor people and poor parents are hard workers and doing everything they can to provide for their kids. Um, and that we should be aimed at boosting the odds of family success by expanding some of these initiatives and creating new ones along these lines. And I have some further questions and ideas, but I think I'll save them for other people's comments. Thank you. Good evening. One sign of a uh, remarkable book is that it makes you think about a situation from so many different angles and with so many different caveats in mind. To put in other words, a remarkable book problematizes the situations and circumstances which might have seemed so simple at initial glance. In American Dream, Jason DePaul goes farther than that in that he problematizes an already immense social problem. How to think about and what to do about public assistance and the kinds of people who made or make use of it. As we've heard already, he presents a rich array of data, case studies, anecdotes, overviews of policy debates, and other pieces of information in order to deliver a message that people who make use of public assistance are not as easy to figure out as many would believe. And those that work to design or deliver that assistance from case managers interfacing with clients to presidents of the United States are equally complex figures. This leaves us with a lot to talk about. And in my time, I can only talk about a little of what he presents to us. I want to focus my remarks, therefore, this evening on those that make use of public assistance, largely because there is someone on this panel and others in the audience who are far more insightful about the politicians policymakers and public debates discussed in this book. So I will stick to familiar ground, not simply because it's a safer space for me to occupy, but because DePaul's work puts on the table, I believe, some key questions and issues for those of us in the academic community who pay specific attention to the life experiences of people who had or currently do make use of public assistance. I focus my remarks on this audience because I think that DePaul's book elucidates a particular challenge for, for us in our efforts to make better sense of the life experiences of America's poor. Now, amongst many things, what's striking to me about DePaul's depiction of the use of public assistance is his attentiveness to the rhythms and patterns of their life experiences. By this, I do not simply mean his detailed account of their daily endeavors, although to be sure, readers will get a rich description of the everyday lives of the three women and their children and many others in this account. Rather, I mean to acknowledge that DePaul consistently presents to the readers the understanding that life experience for public assistance users escapes convenient depiction 
through much of the academic lexicon that is used to interpret and assess the lives of America's urban poor. Some of this lexicon's key terms that have been brought into discussion by scholars include language like motivation, values, and incentives. And each of these terms and some others have been used consistently, or have been consistently applied to matters concerning the relationship of the poor to work and to family life. For instance, a lengthy conversation has ensued since the 60s about whether the poor, particularly poor black Americans, are motivated to work, have the right kinds of work-centered values, and if so, what kinds of incentives or sanctions will funnel them into work opportunities. An analogous range of questions and concerns has been applied to their relationships with their children and family. DePaul does not avoid addressing how the discussion about culture has unfolded over the past few decades. However, Rather than surrendering to the analytical boundaries imposed by cultural critics of the poor, he instead demonstrates how the rhythms and patterns of life in low-income circumstances render much of the cultural analysis of the poor as unnecessarily rigid and typecast. Life never holds steady for anyone, much less for poor people who experience sickness, threats, unforeseen problems and conditions, as well as some circumstances that they are fully used to confronting. And this means that motivation, values, incentives, and other terms that are applied to extraordinarily aspects of the total picture of their lives must be rethought. DePaul gives us evidence that as researchers and critical observers of the life, of, life experience of the poor, we must move from too strong a commitment to applying or testing specific concepts and terms in order to definitively ascertain the capacities of poor people, but rather use these terms in conjunction with assessments of various conditions, caveats, and special circumstances in order to document the possibilities for certain outcomes and processes relevant to advancing beyond a state of poverty. For example, we learned that assessments of motivation to, to work do little to explain how and when Angie and Jewel, two of the women that are central to the story, decide to go to work and what they do in determining to keep or abandon certain jobs. It is the rhythm and pattern of their involvements in the world of work, which is highly interwoven with the rhythms and patterns of their home lives that lead to the options available to them and of the choices that they make. So then what to make of the cultural analysis of the poor, given the transitory and contextual nature of the lives of poor people? I maintain that efforts towards documenting the life worlds of such people is crucial. And by that, I do not mean a simple listing of the particular challenges or obstacles that any individual or group of poor people face, nor descriptions of either how they put forth heroic efforts to overcome seemingly insurmountable barriers in their way, or succumb to them through their own faults or as a result of being poorly equipped with societal resources to meet those challenges. Instead, it seems to me that DePaul has offered a foundation for serious analytical inquiry into how to better connect the structural, social, cultural, and psychological parameters for action and inaction on the part of the urban poor. The discussion then becomes one of not whether the poor have the right values or not, or if those values differ or are similar to those of us in so-called mainstream America, or what degree or depth of incentive or sanction will produce a certain social outcome relevant to work or to family life. But rather we are positioned to think about how and why do certain incentives, do certain sanctions matter to specific situations, to specific job choices, to specific decisions to leave jobs, to decisions to take in individuals as a part of one's family unit, or to decisions to leave the household, thus leaving the rest of the family under the care of someone else? Now, this poses an immense challenge for researchers. The very nature of what we do lends towards generalizable findings, towards robust conclusions, towards trying to, to provide with definition and accuracy some insight into the cultural dynamics circumscribing the lives of poor African Americans or poor people more generally. And I submit that DePaul's work, particularly around questions of the culture of the urban poor, give us a moment to rethink how we connect these issues, how we connect the very lexicon that we have depended upon for so long to make sense of the lives of the urban poor, to a more critical, a more rigorous analysis of the context, the caveats, the conditions that allow for very different choices to be made, that can simultaneously 
spell in the end something positive as well as something negative. It would be foolish for me to declare at this moment that there's some easy end solution or, or, or end goal to this kind of commitment for researchers. Say for the fact that we do something that Nepal does, we will continue to do something that Nepal does in massive fashion. And that is to discover that after all, the poor are no less complex in their approach to everyday life, as are the middle classes and wealthier people. And for researchers who are interested in the cultural dimensions of poor people, there stands considerable room to better recognize and embrace that complexity and to better illustrate the extent to which both action and inaction unfold around the specific context of everyday life. I think that Paul has given us a platform to think and to push these issues. And I would hope that aside from simply reading and absorbing a very well-told story about the case of certain individuals, that we can take the message of his work to reformulate our own research questions and our agenda for the sake of healthier analyses of America's urban poor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll take questions now, and you can direct them at Jason or um, anybody else on the panel. Helen? Can't point and hit. Maybe stand up. I'm not. Is, do we have a mic in the audience, or you just have to speak loudly? Okay. Um, yeah. How did you uh, find the uh, women's music like I met Opal first <clears throat> in a. Uh, I met Opal in a motivation class in a welfare office. It would really take Tom Wolfe to do justice to the scene, but there are about eight people in the class. The instructor was fretting that she really wasn't trained and qualified to teach this class. One woman was drunk. One woman was eating potato chips under the no eating sign. And the instructor said, called on Opal to come up and do a practice job interview. And Opal did this walk across the room that really, I wish I had it on film. It was this kind of languid, loose-limbed, kind of pimp roll thing across the, across the floor in which she was advertising her utter contempt for the whole proceeding. So she got to the chair, and she bounced into the chair like this, and the woman said, the, the fake instruct, instructor said, tell me about yourself. And she said, I'm Opal Cables. Well, what motivates you? Being around smiling people. Uh, tell me about your child care situation. That won't be a problem. I'll have it taken care of by Tuesday. <laughs> and you know, the drunk woman woke up, and then people started yelling, you go, girl. Um, she just lit up the whole room, and then like that, she turned it off, and she just said, but I don't want to go get a job, and she kind of slouched back into her chair. So I knew she was up to something interesting. I didn't know what. Uh, she was sort of bi bilingual. Um, I went up to her after the class and introduced myself, and uh, not that I was hard to spot in the class of eight <laughs> women. <laughs> she, <laughs> I followed her. She, she did have a job at that point. She was cleaning a, a hospital. She worked in the GI lab at a hospital. And so I wasn't thinking about drugs at all. Okay, I'm, I'm on a total... I'm thinking about welfare, I'm on a totally different subject. And she tells me her life story, and it's just full of all this sort of self-denigration about how she had been in a gang, and she had been a welfare cheat, and she had done all these bad things. And she said in the middle of this, but you know, one thing I never did is I just never got involved in drugs. That's just, you know, a lot of my friends, I just never got involved in that. Huh? So, okay. I went to her house, and she had a big no drug sign on her house, and there was a guy in her living room who didn't, she didn't introduce him, but he was a guy standing there with a no drugs button on his lapel. So I'm from the New York Times, and I can say there are no drugs here. <laughs> uh, well, Opal, it was a recovery building for people getting out of drug rehab. And Opal, the reason the, the guy was glowering, it was her boyfriend, he was glowering because she had been on a binge the night before. And so she was an, an addict at that point in the process of backsliding. But um, you, know, you couldn't have proved it by me at that point. Yeah. And through Opal, I met her, I followed Opal for a while, and through her, I met Angie and Jewel. I'm 
I've been asked to repeat the question, so I, I'll, I think the speakers heard it, but for the video, and so I'll crunch it down. There's a reference to uh, Senator Wellstone <laughs> and the lack of protest about the passage of the 1996 bill, and uh, what do you think are the prospects uh, for such activity now? <laughs> I'll jump into it first and, and probably won't answer the question as fully as you like, but what I think those of us who were not poor have to keep in mind is that to a certain extent, poor folks are better organized than we may think they are. The problem with those of us who were not in those circumstances is the reading of that social organizing sometimes is problematic. And I think about a number of years ago, the, the, the best example was a segment of Nightline that aired, or it must have been about five years ago, that featured a gang leader in New York City, a, a Latino gang leader who was active in getting his members to vote and, and register voters and what have you. And I had conversations on, on campus here with folks about this Nightline segment and a few that saw. And the lingering message was that a gang leader is organizing the people, a gang leader is involved with people. Now this individual, the street name was King Tone, was certainly a gang leader, but he was also a father, a neighbor, a part-time employee at a local business. The overriding identity was gang leader. And everything that went into his organizing efforts was read as either a gang leader trying to hustle people or a stupid gang leader that couldn't function in mainstream society. Now, it might just have been that for his failures, he was just bad at certain activities. But why that overriding identity becomes the main point of focus, I think corrupts a vision of what's going on for a lot of low-income people and their capacity to organize. What's seen as, for mainstream folks, as unsophisticated or ignorant political actors might be the way in which people are articulating a different political agenda, one that may not make sense to us in the way in which we live our everyday lives, but could very well be the basis for not approaching a polling place in the first case. So while I don't directly get to your question, I think there's a lot of work that those of us outside of this context have to do to rethink behavior amongst this population and to give them the space to be imagined and conceptualized differently than we often do. I'll add a, add a one, one short word. I don't think Jewel has ever voted for president before, but she got registered outside of Walmart a few months ago. And she says she's motivated to vote against Bush, and I asked her why. And she said um, because of the, there's a new rap song out about that Bush knocked down the towers. Do you all know about that? The, the Jadakiss song? Um, they, why, did, why did Bush knock down the towers? So I'm not entirely sure what the, how the moral of that plays into your, your question other than um, her tracking of public affairs has been sporadic and idiosyncratic. <clears throat> she doesn't read your stories in the Times? <laughs> no, I, I, sent, I, sent, I sent her the book and she, she said sort of apologetically about a month later, I, I, I am going to get to it. I'm go I am going to read it. <laughs> Questions about uh, Congress's reauthorization of the 1996 Act and um, suggestions for what they might do uh, similarly or different from what they're now doing. In broad terms, I guess I see three areas. One is the making work pay agenda. I mean, it's just clear from Angie's experience and from Jules, um, they're never going to be able to earn their way to, quote, self-sufficiency, you know, a word that I don't think is very helpful in trying to d describe what the goal should be for them. Um, they need subsidized health care. They need the ongoing earned income tax credit. Um, they need food stamps. They need, they need this set of worker supports and probably a, more, a sturdier and expanded one. Uh, so one is 
to ameliorate some of the economic hardship in the lives of, of uh, low-skilled workers. That would be number one. Number two, the kids. W one place I think I'd start with some sort of uh, after-school investment initiative. I mean, Angie's kids just came home, as I said before, to nothing. They were, just, they were always around the house. There was nothing there for them. Um, there is one helpful piece of research in Milwaukee. The, the New Hope Project uh, was a, uh, invested in high-quality aftercare program, and it had a huge effect, but o although only for the boys. Um, there's something about boys entering adolescence that's, you know, in these neighborhoods that's a particularly hazardous passage, and by giving the boys a, pl a safe place to go after school, um, it had the statistical equivalent of raising their SAT scores by 100 points. In other words, on a statistical scale that looked at their school behavior and achievement. I mean, that's a big difference, right? What middle class parent wouldn't do something to help his kid get, score 100 points higher on the SAT score? That's just one place we could start in terms of, by no means is it a complete agenda for, um, for, for the kids, but it's one place at least we have some good research we could start. Bush actually made a proposal at one point to cut the funding for after school programs. The third place, I think, is on the fatherhood initiative, and that's probably where I feel the most passion. Um, there is a marriage agenda in the reauthorization bill. Um, most of the left is against it, or at least sort of tepidly against it. I'm sort of tepidly for it um, in that I don't see what harm it could do, although I would like to expand it and uh, not constrain it to marriage, but broaden it out to fatherhood and to employment. I don't think we know what to do for the men, how to make them, how to raise their earnings, how to connect them with their, better connect them with the child's, with their, with their kids. Um, the way I kind of look at it is we're, we're where we are with the men, where we were 25 years ago with the women. We, we said, hey, these women aren't going to get employed. There aren't jobs for them. They don't have the skills. They don't have the child care. And we sort of found a way to make it sort of kind of work. You know, we're, that, we're 25 years ago now with the men. So throw out some money and, and insist on really rigorous evaluation and figure out who's right about what would help the men, whether the conservatives are right or the liberals are right or some unknown combination. Um, but that's really what I'd like to, I'd like to see both sides come together on that. I, I really don't understand why there can't be a bipartisan um, compromise on that. I mean, you know, the, it seems like both sides are now celebrating the at least beginnings of su employment success for the women, so why couldn't they rally around and try to do something similar for men? You know why academics like Jason, he cites the need for more uh, randomized evaluations <laughs> and rigorous research. <laughs> Larry? Questions about the role of the earned income tax credit in the lives of your uh, respondents. Um, just so we're all on the same page, in case anybody doesn't know what the earned income tax credit, it's it's a it's really hard to write about for, because it's such a dull word, right? If it was just if it was called welfare, it'd be so much easier to write about. It. The earned income tax credit is this opaque phrase for a, a remarkable thing that the government does every year, which is it mails out big checks to poor people. Uh, the federal between in Wisconsin. Between the combination of the federal and the state programs, Angie was getting about five between four and five thousand dollars a year in one lump sum. Every every uh, January, she'd get her W two statements. She'd hop a bus to H and R Block, and she'd come back a week or two later with this big chunk of money. Um, so you asked, did it work? Sort of, kind of. Well, yeah, that's a pretty good way of putting it. I mean, it, well, it's been, it worked in the sense that she got the money. Um, I suppose your story, your question, really goes deeper in what she'd do with the money. So, Sometimes she bought, one year she bought a car. Sometimes she put it towards things that we would count as social mobility, something that could enhance her ability to work and, um, and move up, um, like buying a car. Uh, that's the best example. Jewel bought a car with hers as well. Sometimes she bought furniture. Sometimes she just paid on old debts. Um, she put it to a mix of con immediate consumption, splurges, and what we might call social investment. Um, so yeah, she got it, and yeah, it worked. I mean, without it, she'd, it accounted for about 20% of her income, so without it, she'd really be lost. Oh, in Milwaukee, they have the, you know, the used car lots have sales, and after they have bookkeepers come on the car lot, you know, come, we'll fill out your taxes for you if you use your rebate to buy our car, furniture stores, yeah, it's, it's uh, fiesta time.
this this bill, the welfare act ninety six, eliminated a uh, entitlement that was originally written in terms of children. It was for children uh, care in the home and so on. And moreover, we have, you know, we if we believe in anything in this country, it's supposed to be equal opportunity, which I think says something about children. Questions about the uh, relative neglect of uh, children, both in the original bill and any uh, discussion of reauthorization. Yeah, I don't think the the status of children was ignored in the original debate. I think the status of children was decried and lamented by the conservatives, sincerely in some cases, maybe not sincerely in others, but blamed on AFDC. In other words, something really happened between Reagan and Gingrich. Uh, Reagan attacked poor people for cheating the programs. Gingrich attacked the programs for, for hurting the poor. Uh, Gingrich said, look, the state of children in this country is terrible, and it's all because we have this thing called AFDC, and, and look, what, you can't sustain civilization, he said, with 12-year-olds having babies and 15-year-olds um, shooting each other and 17-year-olds getting diplomas that they can't read, and it's all because of welfare. So I don't think that, w that children was left out of the equation. The solution f from the architects of the bill was that by putting the mothers to work, that work itself was going to have a kind of radiant social pow uh, powers. It was going to bring Clinton. We talked about work brings order and dignity and meaning and structure to our lives. I got to interview him for the book, and I asked him what gave him where he got those ideas from. Why At some point in his presidency, he stopped talking about welfare as a, as a means of economic uplift, and he started talking about it as a, as a means of, of, of social uplift, of social reorganization. And I asked him about that, and he's, he connected it to his own life of growing up with a working single mother and says that his mother's work had given him uh, a compass. Um, so I'm disappointed because I, I think that's a sort of mythic idea. You know, when they asked my son what he could do and when he goes to school and asks you what your mama does, he can give an answer. That's a sort of mythic idea we have. A, the, the single struggling mother is going to inspire her kids, and I just didn't see any evidence to, to support it. Um, your other question had to do is whether, whether I feel, you didn't put it this way, do I feel any nostalgia for going back to the old system, or do I feel we've lost something in, 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 the, in the loss of entitlement? I actually don't. Um, I think the old system was really destructive, civically and politically and racially. I mean, it gave poor people too little to live on, and it despised them for taking it, and it, it set them up to be blamed as freeloaders. I mean, Angie, when she arrived in Milwaukee 10 years ago, she got off a bus to go on welfare. She was somebody taking from society. She was somebody who was an easy target for people to blame. And now nobody can say that about her. She's at the nursing home every day at 6 in the morning, you know, doing her part to serve humanity, literally. And you know, nobody can point a finger at it anymore. I think she has a larger political and civic claim on all of our loyalties and, and, and to a larger share of the American prosperity. Now, I don't think that our politics are delivering it right now. I think it's a scandal that people that, that were in the middle of a presidential campaign and, and neither, neither candidate has a word to say about people on, for her behalf. 
Um, but I think at least the underlying conditions are there to make a case for her in a better way than there would have been eight, ten years ago. This is a question really about uh, being a reporter. I think it's a question about the role of the reporter as reporter versus getting involved. Whether journalistic ethics is an oxymoron. <laughs> uh, I started out by wanting to be totally an observer. Uh, I didn't want to start changing the, fam the dynamics of what it was I was supposed to be reporting on. I understood that that was impossible just by the fact that I was there. I was changing anything somewhat. As time went on, I threw in the towel more and more and began to be more involved. Um, no, I never t called Child Protective Services or ever got close, but um, yeah, I would, I would buy meals or I would. At one point, um, I drove Angie and the kids down from Milwaukee to Mississippi. We rented a van and went home for her family reunion. And um, it was a great way to spend time with Angie. I had a tape recorder, you know, going in the van for 14 hours and got to meet all her family. I mean, those barriers came down bit by bit. And the book, um, there was a little glitch in the writing. It, uh, I thought I thought I thought it'd be done a few years ago. So I, uh, after what in my mind I had crossed the you know, the book ends in this year. After that, I felt fully free to be kind of a quasi social worker for the family, thinking I was done, but I wasn't really done. But so it happened in, in increments. But um, no, certainly never. I mean, I tried to get opal and drug rehab a few times, but again, after the period was over. I want to thank uh, Jason and the panel. Uh, I want to give people time to uh, get a book, and uh, Jason will stay here for a while, and we'll be able to informally uh, answer questions. So please uh, join me in thanking Jason and the panel.